Hello, everyone. Welcome. I can't believe this is our last lecture of the fall series. My goodness, where has time gone? I want to take this opportunity to thank every single one of you for being supportive this fall. We really appreciate it. Um, without you, we wouldn't exist. And I also want to thank CCTV. And of course, I want to thank our program committee, because again, they're invaluable for bringing us all these fabulous lectures. So with that in mind, is Beth online? Beth Wood, who's our program chair? Beth, are you here? I don't know where she is. Oh, goodness. Well, Britta, maybe you could give us a little of little background for us. Britta Tan, who I think is familiar to you, we are in for a real treat if you haven't seen her before and even so. Britta, take it away. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's wonderful to be back here. I love these presentations so much and I always get to talk about things that I'm so passionate about, um, which is great. So um, as some of you may know, um, I'm an architectural historian and local historian. I work for a company uh, called VHB as um, the Director of Cultural Resources doing historic preservation planning. Um, I also serve on the um, Vermont Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. So very active in the historic preservation world uh, locally and statewide. And um, Today, I'll be presenting about uh, the Redstone Historic District on the University of Vermont campus. Um, oh, there's Beth. Hello, sorry, Thank I had you. trouble signing in. That's okay. I gave a little bit of a background um, on myself, but feel free if you wanted to do an introduction. Um, um, yeah. Okay, um, and I don't know if Carol mentioned two quick things that we're going to be sending out an evaluation to members soon. Did Carol mention that? Um, anyway, this is our last lecture of the fall series and welcome everyone. And it, probably within the next day or so, our members will be receiving um, by email a feedback form. And we'd really, really appreciate your thoughts. If you could return that to us in the next week, we really do take your thoughts into consideration and appreciate hearing back from you. Also, our speakers really um, also welcome your, your questions during the Q&A period. And actually you can enter and type in your questions anytime during the lecture or during the Q&A, but they do really look forward to them. So please do submit your questions. Um, hopefully I'll be quick here and won't repeat too much of what Britta said. Um, she's spoken to us a number of times and brought us on a number of wonderful armchair tours around the Burlington area. And we're, uh, we're in for another one today that will be a real treat, I'm sure. Um, Britta earned her bachelor's in the history of art and architecture from Middlebury College, her master's in historic preservation from the University of Vermont. And she has worked in that field for well over a decade. She's documented, as she maybe mentioned to you, hundreds of historic buildings and districts throughout Vermont, including one that she's going to tell us about today. Um, she works as an architectural historian and preservation planner for a local planning and engineering firm. And she was appointed by the governor to serve as the architectural historian on the Vermont's advise, on Vermont's Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. So it's a great pleasure to welcome back Britta Tun. It's all yours, Britta. Thank you so much, Beth. And just want to make sure you can see my screen now, correct? My you can. Okay, great. <laughs> um, Okay, so today I'm talking about the Redstone Historic District. So this is the Redstone portion of the University of Vermont campus. And um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar where this is. If you're not, it's uh, located on the east side of South Prospect Street, um, south of Main Street. So, you know, about where Cliff Street um, comes up and enters, uh, and has the intersection with South Prospect Street. So um, I'm gonna give a little bit of a background on the development of this campus as um, an estate historically in the 1880s, and then um, talk a little bit about um, women at UVM as students and sort of talk about the development of this uh, campus and some of the architecture we see. Um, and 
what I want to say is that this lecture actually comes out of a large project I worked on um, last year. Um, I uh, did an update to the National Register nomination for the Redstone Historic District. It had been written in 1996 and um, at the time, it was a you know it 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 very thoroughly documented all the buildings um, and structures that were fifty years old. Since that time, two buildings on um, in this historic district at the Redstone campus, um, Coolidge Hall and Blundell Blundell House, have uh, since turned fifty years old. So um, this update, in part, was done to be able to incorporate them as contributing resources to this uh, historic district and. Um, this project actually came out of um, some um, alterations that occurred to the music building, which is a 1974 addition to Southwick Hall. I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, but this is this project is mitigation for alterations to that building, which, although it's not yet 50 years old, is actually considered um, architecturally significant. And um, I will talk about that in a little while. So. Um, what are, we are looking at here is a view looking east across the Redstone campus as it looked in 1939. Um, we are missing a couple buildings that were built after this. Coolidge Hall at the corner here between Southwick and what is um, known as Robinson Hall, the old carriage barn for the estate, and the 1960s Blundell House, which is um, over here today. And um, you can see the water towers, you can see the estate building, um, the original Redstone Hall, and um, you can also see a complex of barns that once existed to the east of Robinson Hall, and this is Slade Hall right here. Gives you a sense of how rural this area of campus was um, pretty much through the 60s, once a lot of development occurred to the east with the construction of the athletic campus and to the south with the construction of um, several dormitories. Okay, so um, here we see a view today looking towards the Redstone campus um, from uh, South Prospect Street. And one of the striking things that you see um, first when you're looking this way is this jagged wall. Now that is an 1888 feature and um, it's local Redstone. Um, that some of it came actually from um, the property right here. And then some of it came from a quarry that was down on um, so off of South Willard Street near Ledge Road, where it intersects Shelburne Road. So um, it's just a really unique wall with this, we call it jagged coping, kind of, you know, one of the themes for the development of this estate was to keep it sort of rustic and natural and allow it to sort of blend into its surroundings. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we see some close-ups of the buildings and how it achieved that. Um, so, let's see, let me get to the next slide. Um, so, the Redstone Estate was developed in about 1888. So, what we're looking at here is an 1869 map of the area. So, um, in the right half of the circle, um, to the east of South Prospect Street, which at the time was actually called Tuttle Street, um, this would be the area where the Redstone Estate was developed. Um, so. Um, Andrew and Margaret Buell in 1888 purchased a 120 acre parcel from Franklin Hendy, and that's whose name you see here, um, associated with a small house, small structure, um, for $25,000. That's the equivalent of about $700,000 today. Um, Hendy was a merchant who returned to, um, who turned to farming in his retirement. So he owned a lot of, this was mostly agricultural lands. Um, so the property stood opposite Overlake Park. So Overlake Park was a really expansive estate owned by um, a railroad tycoon, Legrand B. Cannon. He was also a banker, a capitalist, and, is, and um, you know owned a steamboat companies. The estate of Cannon, which was called Overlake, is no longer standing, but there are a couple uh, buildings uh, still at the corner of Cliff Street and South Prospect Street, a caretaker's cottage and a carriage barn that are still there. Um, his estate burned down and was redeveloped as the Overlake Park neighborhood in Burlington in like the 20s and 30s. Um, and here now we are looking at an 1890 map 
And at this point, the Buell Estate, which would become the Redstone Campus, was developed. So here we see the main house. This is the carriage barn, and this is called Redstone Lodge, which is a little caretaker's cottage. But it gives you a sense of, of some of the, um, the drives that, that wrapped around. The central one is where guests would go and enter the estate. We have this one off to the side going into the back, which was more of the... Uh, the, the service drive um, for employees and for deliveries and whatnot. Um, here is Overlake, so you can get a sense of how extensive Cannon's property was. Um, so there is some speculation that Buell decided to build his estate here on ground that was actually higher than Overlake um, to sort of compete um, with Cannon and say, well, you might have a bigger estate. Mine is higher up and has more sweeping views west across the lake. Um, so um, let's talk about the Buells briefly. And um, we have Andrew, Andrew Buell on the left and Margaret Buell, his wife, on the right. Um, Andrew was born in Whitehall in 1841 and began working in lumber mills there and he climbed the ladder of the industry and eventually just amassed a huge fortune by um, having involvement with some really prominent um, American and Canadian lumber companies, some of which he ran. Um, he arrived in Burlington in 1886, although his primary um, business was in Buffalo, even at that time. So. It's thought that he might have built Redstone as sort of like a summer home and he was maybe for a little while traveling between Buffalo and Burlington, but eventually would come to settle in Burlington and own a lumber company here. Um, and the Buells hired um, a relatively prominent architect, Herbert Burdett, to design the mansion house. And um, G. N. Willard um, of the Willard Quarry, which I talked about down the road, um, actually completed all the, uh, all the masonry work himself and provided most of the stone. Um, and here we're seeing the main house on the left, um, the carriage barn here at the bottom right, and um, we see the lodge, which was the caretaker's cottage um, in the upper right. And you get a sense of how open. So if you see redstone today, there are a lot of trees, a lot of vegetation. We still have an open lawn, but this is really, you know, the, because it was agricultural land, um, it was quite open at the time when they developed the estate. And the um, Burdett's, Burdett's actual architectural style that he was well-versed in was the Richardsonian Romanesque. And he actually worked for Henry Hobson Richardson who developed that style in the 1880s. And so we can really see Richardson's influence here. And that is in the use of natural stone to add a kind of rustic um, patterning to the facades of buildings, the use of towers, of steep roof lines with small dormers and these Romanesque style arches. And, um, you know, these images here really show how the landscape evolved over time, over several decades um, with the help of the caretaker and gardeners. Um, this really developed into a very verdant property. There were extensive gardens, um, stands of woods, trees. So this is the northern entrance. This is the caretaker's cottage again. And here we see the landscape already transforming um, into, a, into a much more vegetated place. Um, so as I mentioned before, maybe a little bit, we had that drive kind of enter the back um, of the building. So this, this um, estate was designed very intentionally to have the main buildings front and center. There were ancillary buildings no longer standing to the east of the main building, uh, Redstone Hall, such as a laundry building, storage facilities, sheds, barns, and, and another complex of barns behind the carriage barn. In 1917, actually, 
The estate was put up for sale by the Buells' daughter after her parents had died in 1916 and 1917. And this is what the real estate listing described the estate as. Um, Redstone overlooking Lake Champlain. There are extensive lawns, a large orchard in Bering State, and two groves of pine trees. A large garden plot has been planted for flowers and vegetables. The buildings comprise a house, garage, and stables with house for chauffeur or coachman and lodge. Other houses are a farmer's cottage, ice house, greenhouse, tool house, and hay barns, everything in first class condition. So Buells' daughter was not actually successful in selling the house in 1917 when she listed it uh, for sale, but um, it would eventually be sold in 1921 to UVM. But I will talk more about that in a little bit. I wanna just quickly mention the two water towers here. And these are, I think, personally, pretty fascinating um, bits of infrastructure. A lot of people see them. They wonder what they are. They're, you know, just they see this one on the right covered in cell phone antennas, which is is much more recent um, alteration to it in addition to it. Um, this one here on the left, the brick um, round structure was built in 1881. It actually predated the construction and development of the Redstone Estate. Um, it was intended to improve and expand Burlington's existing waterworks system. And it was leveraging this hilltop setting and an existing pump house and reservoir that were built in the 1860s and expanded in the 1880s over on Main Street. Um, kind of across from where Morrill Hall is and um, and um, it was connected to water lines there. Um, and there was um, a steel holding tank inside this brick structure. So this is really just a covering for, um, for the actual tank inside. Water would be released in a consistent and reliable manner to the surrounding neighborhood and the UVM campus. So this really enabled expansion of the campus as well. Um, it would constantly be refilled by water that was pumped from the reservoir. And, you know, we have this really beautiful picturesque form um, that was really a testament to the popularity of the Queen Anne style at the time and sort of understanding that infrastructure like this was really quite new and modern and they wanted to sort of memorialize it through a building that was that was beautiful and, and had some um, aesthetic appeal. The new, more modern one we see to the right here was built in 1934 to 35, and it was more efficient than the old one. So it was really built to replace this old one. The old one would still hold water um, for emergencies, um, but the new one was the primary source of, um, of you know, dispersing water to the neighborhoods. And um, it really did allow for the growth of the UVM uh, Redstone campus, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, it was erected by the Pittsburgh Des Moines Steel Company, which was a national supplier of steel, particularly used for water towers. Um, here's just a, a map to explain this. This is on the left, the 1890 map. We see the round water tower here. The reservoir is located up here on Main Street in the little pump house. So the water lines, this is, weren't exactly following this red line, but you see how they were connected. Um, 1942, this map on the right, we see the round water tower there, um, but the metal one has been built here and that's um, the primary one being used. Here's just an example. This is actually Alabama of another Pittsburgh Des Moines steel water tower, just to show you that this was a pretty standardized design and pretty iconic design for water towers. You'll see them all over the country looking like this. Um, a little fun fact is that um, in 1936, right when one of the main buildings on the campus, um, new buildings was built, the Southwick Hall, McKim, Mead and White, who are a relatively prominent architecture firm from New York City, they were really adept at um, designing buildings in the colonial revival style. They wanted to cover the steel water tower with this sort of nicer looking beautiful brick tower that had this kind of colonial revival monumental look. Um, and this was their proposal and you can actually see the, the steel water tower on there. It never got built, <laughs> but it's just fun when I found that. Um, so 1945 view here of 
the campus. So um, gives you a sense of what it looked like. So this is Southwick building, which was built in the thirties. I'll talk more about that in a little bit, built to the east of Red, or excuse me, to the south of Redstone. This is plans for Coolidge Hall that was built in the mid 1940s. So that is there standing today. Um, so just a little background on the development of the women's campus um, as it became um, used for. So in 1921, UVM bought the estate from Buell's daughter and son-in-law for $50,000 with the purpose of creating a women's campus. Um, so the overall layout of the campus and um, really preserved the landscape and the layout of the Redstone Estate. It wasn't actually changed all that much other than the addition of a few buildings on the outskirts to preserve that open green space. Um, so the purchase of this campus was the same year. So kind of interesting, 1921, it was the same year that Vermont ratified the 19th Amendment that happened on February 8th of 1921. And it was exactly 50 years after women were first admitted to UVM. Um, so the establishment of the Redstone campus it followed in the tradition of other prominent Northeastern universities that were starting their own really segregated female colleges. Think of Radcliffe College at Harvard that was established in 1894, Barnard College at Columbia in 1889. Um, and to give you a sense of, and I'll explain this a little more in detail, what you know, women's education was sort of thought of at that time that this was, um, that the, the women's college was established at UVM. So the Burlington Free Press article declared that the new Redstone campus would provide unparalleled education for the quote, future mothers of Vermont. Um, so women at UVM. I uh, mentioned that women were first admitted in 1871. And um, while this marked an important step forward in recognizing the academic capability of women and giving them opportunities that were you know, previously only afforded to men. Um, they were typically treated as second-class students. Um, and, you know, based upon that quote in the Burlington Free Press, really education was sort of a, an interim um, activity before marriage or preparation for marriage. So women initially um, were housed um, in some, they lived in private houses in 1891 at Grassmount here, which is on Main Street, um, was converted into a women's dormitory. Um, these pictures here are the first two women to graduate, um, to enter and graduate from UVM, um, Ellen Hamilton and Lita Mason. And they were also the first women in the United States to be admitted into Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society. And these are their tags that they were awarded through that. So just to give a little bit of context on, um, you know, women entering sort of the realm of higher education in the 20s. As you imagine, there was a lot going on um, at that time. And, um, you know, the establishment and these development and the development of these women's campuses and really, um, you know, promoting uh, higher education for women came out of the involvement that women had uh, professionally in the workforce and socially during their home front activities um, in World War One, when, you know, women fulfilled you know, roles that were typically um, only associated with men. For example, a woman um, led the UVM newspaper. She was the publisher, the interim publisher, while many of the students were um, away either at war or training. Um, once they got back, of course, they took back her position, even though she was highly capable at it. And of course, um, the 19th Amendment being ratified on February 8th, 1921 in Vermont. Um, the same year that Redstone Campus was purchased, um, two very prominent um, suffragists actually spoke at UVM in the fall of 1921. Um, and um, it was a citizenship convocation that was put on by the League of Women Vo Voters. Uh, and um, 
the League of Women Voters was founded um, in 1921, um, 1920, 1921, as a way of continuing to promote um, the involvement of women in, um, in civics, in social life. Um, and it was led by Maude Wood Park. Um, and she was um, the national, she was the chairman at the time of the National League of Women Voters. She was the, formerly the congressional chairwoman of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And she really was very active in lobbying for the 19th Amendment. So she came to speak at UVM during the citizenship convocation along with Catherine Ludington, who was also a prominent suffragist from Connecticut, who was one of the founders of the League of Women Voters as well. Um, so this is a pretty remarkable event that happened. I've been desperately trying to find photographs of it and I have not found them yet. Um, I'm really hoping I will at some point because I'm really curious. I, am, I believe the event was held at the Royal Tyler Theater, which at the time was the gymnasium. But here is a little uh, clip from the newspaper um, article talking about it. Um, you know, it, the citizenship convocation is to remove limitations on women's contribution to civilization. So just a couple really interesting quotes from that, um, from that event. Um, Catherine Ludington um, said, quote, the purpose of the women's movement, the reason that we have been working all these years is to remove the artificial limitations that we may have full power and equal status to render to civilization our contribution as women. And um, Maude Wood Park um, said, quote, you girls in this university are going to have greater opportunity than the girls of my day and age to write in the book of opportunity, which is open to you. What use are you going to make of it? And so really this is, you know, they are celebrating too um, the establishment of the women's campus and Maude Wood Park was also known for really uh, trying to um, recruit um, women to join the League of Women Voters. And it sounds like her remarks are in part, you know, doing that, say, you know, and, and it's just really interesting that they came to speak at UVM um, right at this time when um, UVM was making a real concerted effort to um, increase involvement of women in higher education. Um, so early on, talk a little bit about um, women's activities and um, their education at UVM in the early 20th century. Um, even as, women, as female enrollment was increasing and there was all this talk about women, you know, entering realms that were previously um, only occupied by men, they were still limited in what they were studying. Um, UVM developed its own separate course of study uh, for women during this time, um, which really began decades of phys physical and academic segregation, segregation between male and female students. Um, women were typically directed to courses of study that involved homemaking or teaching that would be an interim profession um, before marriage. Um, in 1911, UVM established the Department of Home Economics after the American Home Economics Association was founded by the American Association of University Women in 1908. Um, so Bertha Terrell um, was uh, the founder of UVM's program, and um, she was really almost solely responsible for developing it. Um, and really the idea is that it was treating homemaking um, as a science and training women in appropriate practical approaches to domesticity. Um, although eventually over the course of the 20th century, it really modernized. Um, but here we see 1915, a group of women learning how to effectively um, cook something, it appears, <laughs> on a little Bunsen type burners. Um, this is the previous location of um, women's um, coursework in um, home economics, which is at the corner of, I believe, Summit Street and Main Street before the Redstone campus um, was established. And actually, women were, would, be continu would continue to be educated in this building for quite a long time, even after Redstone was established. Um, 
And um, in 1921, a teacher training program um, was founded. And in 1927, a four-year elementary education program was started. Um, the Redstone campus, um, after it opened up, really became the center for women's activities at UVM. And it even hosted you know, not only social activities, but um, athletics. Um, the Women's Athletic Association was founded in 1913. And um, many of the sports um, were track, hockey, dance, basketball, rifle shooting. Here we see a 1920s image on the right of women. I think it looks like they're standing in front of, um, possibly in front of Robinson Hall, which is the old carriage barn um, with their rifles. This is the rifle um, practice. And, um, Women, though, were engaging in some co-educational activities um, in which it is has been documented that they really excelled um, in comparison to their male counterparts. Um, those included debating drama and um, participation in academic societies. Um, but one thing that's important to note is that women were not actually educated at Redstone. So it was where they lived, it was where they ate, it's where they socialized, but their courses were still and their classes were on the main campus, which is where the men lived. So they had to make their way from Redstone to the main campus every day, um, regardless of the weather. Um, they were probably not wearing exactly very rugged clothing, <laughs> you know, to get through the snow because they were just expected to dress a certain way. Um, so it was still, it was still difficult for them. I mean, there were barriers for sure. And that was physical that they had to travel to where the men were um, to take their courses. Um, so I'm going to go now through uh, some of the buildings at Redstone and just talk about um, the buildings themselves and um, how they how they related uh, to the women's campus. Um, so this is, um, now we see a closer up of Redstone Hall, originally developed um, for the Redstone Estate by the Buells. Um, so this was the primary dormitory for women. Um, in 1922, it underwent quite an extensive renovation. Um, it was, um, these renovations were completed by a relatively well-known uh, Vermont architect, Louis Sheldon Newton, who actually specialized in rehabilitating older buildings in a more contemporary colonial revival style. And some of the alterations he made were creating these dormer windows up here um, in the attic story so that there could be room for dormitories up there. He enclosed this uh, previous open patio um, and made it sort of like a sleeping porch. Um, and um, women in these dormitories would be under the supervision of what they called a house mother. So she would have her own apartment downstairs and she kind of oversaw um, you know, the activities of women, which included enforcing strict curfews and temperance. Um, and here we see Redstone Hall today, remarkably unchanged. Um, the only change is that there's a circular addition, which you can see the roof of it um, kind of pointing up here um, next to the, the tall chimney um, and that accommodates um, an elevator. And this is Robinson Hall. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the former carriage barn um, built by the Buells as part of the original estate that was here. And again, Louis Newton um, did an, a pretty, probably more extensive renovation here than he did at Redstone. Um, there used to be a series of small little dormers. He made one large dormer here, um, again, to convert this upper story into more dormitory space. And these were the original big carriage barn openings that became windows. And this kind of Palladian window up here in um, the attic story was added. That's a very typical um, feature of the colonial revival style. So Robinson Hall um, housed the cafeteria for women and dormitory rooms. Um, this is Redstone Lodge right here. So um, Redstone Lodge is right at the entrance to the property, the north entrance. And this was the gardener's or caretaker's cottage um, when this was still owned um, by the Buell family. 
And um, after UVM purchased the property, it became faculty housing. Um, so the first faculty member to be housed here was Hovey Jordan and his wife, Ursula. He was a, a professor of histology and embryology. And eventually it became the home of philosophy professor George Dykhausen, not exactly how to pronounce that, um, and his family from 1933 th through the 1980s. So they were there for five decades, living there. And, um, you know, what one thing I've thought about is, you know, it's great that they offered faculty housing here, but um, none of the faculty ho housed here actually really were connected to um, women's um, academic study at all. Um, but uh, the, this building has hardly changed at all. Um, it went through a recent renovation, but that was really, it, it's very historically intact still. And here we see it being a really interesting example of the Romanesque style I talked about. Um, this is called an eyebrow dormer here, this sort of rounded dormer. Um, you see that a lot on Henry Hobson Richardson's buildings. Here we see the tower dormers and um, you know these these arches here and just this really interesting textured facade which is really the only ornamentation on the building itself um, here we have Slade Hall. Um, Slade Hall was built in 1929 and it was the first new building constructed on the uh, on the um, Redstone campus. So Slade Hall is to the south, is kind of in the southwest portion of campus. And um, it was designed by McKim, Mead and White. So I've talked about them before and I've probably talked to mention them in quite a few past lectures because they were such prominent um, designers and they were based out of New York City um, and they, were very adept at designing in the colonial revival style. They designed, um, their firm designed um, City Hall in Burlington. Um, they're responsible for Ira Allen Chapel um, on the main UVM campus and Waterman building. Um, so Slade Hall is a really nice example of a Dutch colonial revival um, building. And you can see um, the gambrel roof is what's really um, gives it the, the Dutch colonial feel. Um, so it was a 25 room dormitory. It opened in 1929 and um, it originally housed 26 women in single rooms in addition to containing um, the matron suite. And here we have an example of what it looks like, um, very, very close to the original plans. Um, Slade Hall just about a year ago went through, or maybe it was two years ago, um, went through a, a really, really lovely renovation. Um, windows were restored, the masonry was, was cleaned and repaired, and then there were some alterations made to the basement right down here to provide some egress and some lighting and converting that into a more usable space. Um, Slade Hall today houses the um, houses students who have um, interest and studies in environmental um, various, you know, env environmental sciences. Um, so this is Mabel Louise Southwick Memorial Hall. Um, most people call it just Southwick Hall. Um, it houses the music department today. It was built in 1936, another McKim, Mead and White uh, firm building. And we could probably see some similarities to, Red, uh, to Slade Hall, um, just this colonial revival style that was really popular at the time. Um, and it actually received partial funding for its construction through a grant from the Public Works Administration as part of the New Deal program. So the New Deal program was offering money for um, the development of schools, both for um, you know, elementary, secondary education and higher education. The rest of the funding came from the estate of John Leonard Southwick, who was a former editor of the Burlington Free Press and whose deceased daughter, Mabel Louise Southwick, had graduated from UVM in 1906. Um, so when it was built, it served as the Women's Student Union Building. So it provided the first dedicated space for physical education, performances, and meeting spaces. So it had a gymnasium on the ground level and a 
performance hall up above in the back. Um, and here's what it looks like today. Um, very intact, although that little medallion here is, I'm not sure if that was never constructed or if it has since been removed. Um, and I just was looking for photos of women, of women gathered at UVM Redstone campus, didn't find a lot except for this, thought it was seasonally appropriate. It's a costume party that was at, um, in the Southwick Hall gymnasium, undated, I'm not sure, probably, maybe it's 1940s, I um, have to say exactly. Um, so now we have the music building addition to the back of Southwick Hall. That's that brutalist sort of modern structure that I referenced earlier, built in 1974. And um, construction began in 1973, and it was designed by a local architecture firm, Burlington Associates. They also designed the Episcopal Church on Cherry Street in Burlington um, at Cherry and Pearl Street or excuse me, Cherry and Battery Street, which is also um, a brutalist style building. This is considered one of the best examples of brutalism in the state. So love it or hate it, I feel like people love to, <laughs> to dislike brutalism. Um, it's stark, it's contrast to Southwick Memorial Hall is pretty remarkable, but it's interesting to know the background of it um, and, and why it became um, a style at the time and what, why did it even exist and what was its purpose and what was its design aesthetic. So it emerged in 1950s in England. It was very popular pretty quickly when it arrived in the United States, say in the 1960s is when, and when you really saw it crop up here popular in college campus buildings. And part of that is because these buildings were, did have a low cost of construction because they are not fancy and they are using pretty plain everyday materials such as steel and concrete. And this is a concrete building. It was almost more of a philosophical approach to architecture rather than an actual uh, style. So um, the idea was, creating simple, honest, functional buildings that accommodated their purpose, the inhabitants and the location um, to the greatest extent po possible. They were efficient buildings. And the design was really more of a reflection of the functionality of the spaces inside and sort of almost this reverence for the materials being used to not try to hide the fact that this is a concrete building. Um, what's kind of neat, and I don't know that everyone sees this, is this undulating sort of glass curtain wall. Um, this is the side that faces, faces east with these um, rounded pillars here. So um, that's attached to Southwick and um, I mentioned early on that um, an addition was put onto this building uh, recently and that prompted this whole um, rewrite of the National Register nomination. So here you see a picture of the addition here on the right. And this was from probably a year ago. So now it is actually um, completed fully. Um, and I sort of love this view. So maybe you appreciate it a little more. I think this courtyard is a lovely space. I actually love the way this building interacts with the historic buildings around it. It kind of recedes to the background. And that was one of the ideas of brutalism. Um, they're not necessarily going to overpower a historic building unless their, their, their size is out of scale. Um, so I have a couple more buildings I'm going to talk about before we wrap up. Um, Grace Goodhue Coolidge Hall, built in 1946, also designed by McKim, Mead, and White. Um, but at this point, the original founders of the firm were no longer involved. These were uh, subsequent principals and architects at the firm. Um, so during World War II, women actually had to vacate the campus and find accommodations elsewhere when hundreds of Air Corps troops arrived in 1943 for academic, academic study and basic military training. So this is a bit of backstory for this building. So after the war, though, um, 
UVM enrollment spiked like crazy and women returned to Redstone and to accommodate the growing student population, four new dormitories were designed by McKim, Mead and White. Three of them have been uh, demolished for a new construction that's east of the Fleming Museum. This was the largest of the four built. Um, and it's, um, it's um, in, in commemoration of Grace Goodhue Coolidge, who was a, then a 1902 UVM graduate and the wife of President Calvin Coolidge, the first lady. So um, it could house 158 women and 65 double and 28 single rooms. And it's kind of angled um, shape is interesting because it allowed it to sort of, um, you know, recede to the background and not overtake space within the green area and sort of frames that southeast corner um, of, of the drive that circles the that uh, circles um, the redstone green. So in some ways it really even helps to define the green as being this open space in the center of the campus. Um, and um, the last building I'm gonna talk about today is Blundell House. So this was built in 1966. And I think when uh, people think about buildings being listed in the National Register, this is maybe not the type of building that initially comes to mind. Um, it is now 50 years old. And that, you know, that fact, plus the fact that it retains quite a quite a lot of historic integrity means that it is absolutely a National Register eligible building, also because it was designed by Freeman French Freeman, who were um, one of the uh, premier um, architectural firms working in the state um, designing modernist buildings with Ruth Freeman um, being responsible for many of the designs themselves, which was significant because here we had a female architect really asserting herself and, and being very influential at a time when there were very few women working in the field of architecture. Um, so this was built as the new um, home economics um, program building. Um, so at the time, um, by the mid 20th century, um, you know, the home economics program, which I described earlier, had really evolved. And by the 1950s, there were three areas of concentration, textiles, education, and dietary study, um, which occurred alongside coursework and practical experience with homemaking. And when this building was designed for this program, the uh, newspapers called it, quote, the last word in modern living and a totally electric home. Um, so it was intended to provide women with practical experience that would help them meet the challenges of home economics as a profession, both in and out of the house. So seniors would live there for seven and a half weeks each semester or of a semester, um, they would care for the house and they would gain experience with um, taking care of a house and experiencing various materials like fabrics, flooring, home furnishings, design. They would have experience cleaning these materials. Um, it was designed uh, to um, uh, promote efficiencies in um, homemaking like you know, there'd be space saving, labor saving, time saving measures like shallow cabinets to eliminate hard to reach storage. Um, by the late 1960s, the purpose of the home economics program really veered away from homemaking and more towards professional training and real rigorous academic study, um, including areas of concentration that included clothing, textiles, design, economics and consumer education, early childhood and human development and pre-professional social work, and finally food and nutrition. By 1980, the school was officially disbanded and some of these areas of study got incorporated into other um, departments. Um, so this is Blundell House today, um, and it looks very much like it did when it was built. Um, Today, currently it's housing the Zadok Thompson Zoological Collections, um, which were rescued from the fire in Torrey Hall in 2017. Um, they were previously in Torrey Hall. So this is, I think, a temporary place for them until Torrey Hall gets renovated. Torrey Hall's on the main campus. Um, so um, 
interesting to kind of tie up and, and conclude this presentation is that in the fall of 1969, the first co-educational dorm was created on the UVM campus and that was Converse Hall. And in 1971, the buildings on the Redstone campus transitioned into co-educational dormitories. So it's just neat to think that's exactly 100 years after women were first admitted to UVM, exactly 50 years after Redstone campus was developed. But then you think about it and you think, wow, it took 100 years <laughs> since the time that women first entered UVM to be able to get this place to this place where they were integrated um, fully into, into the academic and social life of UVM. Um, so that concludes my presentation, and I am really happy now to take some questions that I think Beth Wood is gonna gonna um, bring to me from the chat. Hi, Britta, and yes, thank you. That as always, you've helped us to see and think about buildings that we often drive by in in new and different ways. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, our first question for you. Are there other buildings in the area with similar elements to the original Redstone buildings? That's a good question. I would say Redstone was pretty unique when it was built. There's not a lot of Richardsonian Romanesque architecture. And the fact that Henry Burdett actually studied under Richardson was very significant and why we see such a really good example of it. Um, Billings Library on the on the UVM Green was designed by Henry Hobson Richardson. So that is in the same style, designed by the actual originator of the style himself. Um, another example I can think of is downtown in Burlington. That would be the um, BCA Arts Center next to City Hall. And that is... Um, now, it was originally the firehouse, and that was designed by a local architect who was inspired by this style. But if you're thinking about other estate buildings, um, we don't really have that many more examples of any that are still surviving today, definitely none of which looked like Redstone Hall, and, and a lot of the old estate buildings in uh, Burlington have been lost. Okay. As Redstone has evolved in modern times, are there any elements in the new buildings that carry over from the original buildings at Redstone? There are, and um, the interiors of many of them are quite intact. If you walk into Southwick through the front entrance there, it's pretty stunning. You have these beautiful tiled floor and these two giant marble staircases, curved staircases that go up on either side and they would have gone up to um, the performance space upstairs, which is still technically a performance space today. I think it's mostly used as a practice room, but it is really beautiful. The layout of Southwick has not changed at all. You still have the large room downstairs that was the gymnasium. Redstone Hall is quite intact on the interior as well. Uh, so is Blundell House has hardly changed. I'm not sure. I imagine that Slade and Coolidge have their original dormitory configurations. I'm not sure. I think um, Robinson Hall was altered on the interior to create offices, um, but yeah, that's, you know, not only do these buildings look a lot like they did on the outside, but I think the, at least the interior configuration of spaces is, is quite intact with most, most of them. And how about the, the modern buildings that are further down on Redstone campus? Are there any elements, did they make any attempt to tie those in with any elements that reflect the original buildings? Oh, so like Blundell House or Coolidge Hall? No, like or... Patterson, uh, oh, right? Those, those modern, very well, modern dorms from what the 60s? Or yeah, whatever. okay. Um, I'm not sure that there was a lot of mm. it, that, that was a driving force behind their design. Um, I think they were driven by efficiency, this era of the 60s, the baby boomers are entering college, there is just a building boom and so much, so much new building that um, these were designed to be very efficient buildings first and foremost. Um, and there was less consideration. Of course, they, they do exhibit a sort of modernist aesthetic, which was popular at their time. Um, but 
I wouldn't say that they were necessarily designed to um, to really interact or reflect what was happening on the Redstone campus. Okay. Did the architect that designed the Emma Willard School in Troy, New York also design any buildings at UVM? I don't remember who that architect was. Um, if I knew the name um, of the Emma Willard School architect, I could tell you. <laughs> Well, we'll see if it maybe appears in the chat as we go along. And yeah, if someone back to clarify that who that was, um, I could tell you. <laughs> okay. And I know that before, I just can't remember who it was. Okay. When were the two chapels added to the back of Redstone campus? Oh, those, um, I believe the first one was, um, late 60s maybe but heavily renovated and I did know this and I can't remember the exact dates they were never really considered part of the Redstone campus they were sort of a, a in their own separate area and they were not included in the original National Register nomination um, I evaluated whether they should be included um, in this updated nomination, talked about it with Devin Coleman, the state architectural historian, and we decided not to expand the boundary to include them because their sort of context for why they came to be and where they were located was not really connected to the development and the continued development of the women's college at, um, at the Redstone campus. So, um, I don't have the exact dates offhand, but they were in the second half of the 20th century. Okay. Could you explain a bit about the process that you go through for documenting uh, historic buildings or districts? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. So um, the first preliminary documentation we do is we um, fill out what's called a Vermont Architectural Resource Inventory Form. And this form, um, we would do one for each building. It uh, records baseline information about the building, um, the materials used, when it was constructed, who the architect was, if we know it, the address, the owner, um, what sort of features it has, so almost like a checklist. And then there are several sections. One is a full architectural description of the building. Um, and then there is a section um, called the Statement of Significance. And in that, we create a historic context or architectural context for understanding the building and how it might have architectural or historic significance. We also talk a little bit about the history of the building itself in these forms, and we evaluate how much historic integrity it has. And that really means physically um, how intact is it since from when it was first built. And then that information gets folded into the National Register nomination, which is structured a little differently, but a lot of, of the um, important part of the National Register nomination is for making the case why this district is significant. And it could be, there could be many themes that um, relate to its significance. In this case, we have social history with, with the women's college. Um, we have architecture, of course. We have um, landscape architecture actually as an important theme because of the green and, and, the, and how well-preserved the landscape is. So um, community planning, or excuse me, engineering we use as a theme because of the water towers um, and how innovative their engineering was. So this all gets kind of compiled into a National Register nomination. That's in a nutshell what we do. <laughs> That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and we do have the name of the architect oh, yeah. from the Willard School in Troy, New York, Fred M. Cummings. Not that I'm aware of any buildings on the UVM campus that are designed by Fred M. Cummings. And I know I've heard of him before. I don't remember where he's from, but um, I've studied now all of Redstone campus and the main campus at UVM surrounding University Green because of I did a presentation on that before and did a National Register nomination there too. So that encompasses most buildings on the campus and none of them were designed by Fred Cummings that I'm aware of. And one what will probably be our last question because we're approaching three o'clock. Um, 
we've learned today that the um, dorms Hamilton and Mason were likely named for the first women graduates mm -hmm. of yep. the university. Yeah, to Do you know yep. if the um, if UVM has any uh, policy or procedure it goes through in terms of naming buildings? Uh, I know some are named for donors, but mm -hmm. is there any effort made to sort of balance male female names or any um, process they have for choosing names for new buildings? That's a really good question. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, I do know that many buildings are named for former presidents um, of the college, um, some of which have been um, controversial recently because of involvement in, um, right. in for example, the eugenics movement. Um, and that would be so, the library, the Bailey Howe Library. Yeah, right? Bailey Howe yeah. Library. Um, and so, I don't know that there is a strict um, policy for naming the buildings, but typically it's either to commemorate um, someone um, after a donor, um, you know, in the name of, or commemorate the name of someone uh, per a donor's request. Um, that's most of the buildings I can think of. Okay. Well, thank you, Britta. This has been really um, enlightening as always. And I think yeah. Carol's here with the last word. Yes, Britta, thank you. What fun. We always enjoy having you. Um, I do want to thank everyone again for the fall semester. I want you to look for those feedback forms, which you should be getting hopefully this weekend or the beginning of the week over your email. And wish you happy holidays. We're looking forward to seeing you in the spring. Our program committee is working diligently to bring terrific programs starting in early February, hopefully. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful winter. <laughs>